Great. Well, good afternoon and welcome to this British Academy event, Artists in Time of Crisis. Um, welcome wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Samira Ahmed. I'm the presenter of the TV series Art of Persia on BBC4 and also of Front Row on Radio 4. And the British Academy is the UK's National Academy for the Humanities and Social Sciences. It's a fellowship of world leading scholars, one of whom is, of course, speaking alongside me today. Uh, it's a funding body that supports new research nationally and internationally and a forum for debate and engagement. And I'm speaking uh, from their library. Our speaker this afternoon is Professor. Sir Simon Sharma, who in many ways, of course, doesn't need any introduction. University Professor of History and Art History at Columbia University. He's an award-winning author whose work has been translated into 15 languages and the writer-presenter of more than 40 documentaries on art, history and literature for the BBC. Later this month on Radio 4, you can hear his series, which is a, a personal tour of four great world museums. And in September, He'll be bringing us the TV series The Romantics and Us, um, and that'll be on BBC Two. Today, um, Sir Simon is going to discuss how some of the greatest works of art in the world, from Goya's The Disasters of Water, Picasso's Guernica, have been produced during troubled times. Um, and looking back over the last 500 years, and I think perhaps even further into the past, we'll look at some of the remarkable stories of eight artists who, under extreme stress, have created something unprecedented altering the course of art forever. We'll be showing pretty much, I think, all the artworks that Simon will be discussing, and you can find information about these underneath the video. If, as Simon mentions, any other artworks, you can, of course, use your search engine to view these pieces. And uh, towards the end of our conversation, with about 15 minutes or so to go, we'll take audience questions. So if you'd like to ask one, you can start submitting them as soon as we get going. Um, submit it under the pinned comment in the YouTube comment section and separately you're welcome to tweet during the event and you can copy in the academy's twitter handle at british academy underscore um but simon welcome and i think let me just translate over to you thank you so much samira that's that's very kind and hello everybody and i i have a sort of mixed feelings already about what I'm about to do with and to you. <laughs> because many of you, I think, especially in the lockdown period, um, and now in Britain, looking forward to the opening of museums. God, I wish I was there myself and not the other side of the Atlantic, starting with the National Gallery, I believe, next week. Maybe, may well have been thinking about art as a refuge from the cr terrible crisis we're all living through, multiple crisis in a way. So it's a bit mean, I guess it's a bit kind of um, mean of me to say, oh yeah, but you know, artists actually often rise to extraordinary heights of creativity when they feel the most pressure. I want to start by just um, saying that you know, uh, th that the notion that an artist should somehow feel a responsibility um, to actually respond to crisis, whether social or religious or political, is a pretty modern thing. I'll, I'll have a word or two to say about that later. Um, and if you look at the very first account of what artists thought they were supposed to do, which is really wonderful, um, I urge you to rush out and buy 36 volumes of Pliny's Natural History, <laughs> the guy who was uh, turned into um, solid lava when Vesuvius erupted, or else there would have been even more volumes. You don't get, in his description of the way um, ancient Greek artists were thought of their own vocation, much of a sense that they're supposed to talk about, in the way, for example, Caesar talks about the wars, that that was part of their brief. But it is very interesting that the most famous artist of all in Pliny's natural history, by his own lights, who was a man called Apelles of Kos, clearly felt himself to be a peer rather than a, 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 a subject, a sort of craven and obedient subject of Alexander the Great. He had this kind of odd tutorial relationship with Alexander the Great that Aristotle is supposed to have had. But by and large, it takes a long time for an artist to really respond in a critical or oppositional way, I'd say. Um, and I'm the, the reason I'm, I'm saying all this, I think, and I hope not too long-winded way, I can hear the groaning throughout the web already, um, is that most of the very greatest art that has responded to politics haven't been out of a sense of uncomplicated duty. Artists mostly, nearly all of the ones we're going to talk about today, um, back crabwise, walk crabwise, they kind of bump into a sense of vocation. And 
Graham, if we can, can I have the first um, drawing as it is? It's an ink drawing. Thank you very much. This is an artist called Wang Meng, Chinese landscape artist, 14th century, born in 1308. And uh, this is a detail from it. Um, it, it it's, it's a wall scroll. So it was something that would have been uh, stored in a cylinder and like all classical Chinese landscapes, only taken out for special occasions, and it would roll down a wall. And when we were filming Civilizations, um, it's now kept in Shanghai at the um, Museum of Shanghai. We had the extraordinary kind of heart-stopping moment to sort of see it fall down a wall like a sort of miraculous waterfall, really. So you're seeing the middle of it for the following reason. Wang Meng was, was someone who you would say, and you can probably see, was trained in the classical tradition. You did mountainscapes when you did that. Often they were emblems of the emperor. But he was, he was the so-called youngest of the Yuan artists. Uh, the Yuan dynasty was the Mongol dynasty. But that's a kind of funny way to talk about him because, in fact, he, was, he had a very posh pedigree. He descended, at least he certainly told everybody he descended, from the southern Song emperors, the Song emperors who'd been displaced by the Mongol invaders, which in included, famously included Kublai Khan and so on. So he was a kind of, you know, he, he had a sort of sense that, well, true classical art began with the northern Song dynasty. He was a kind of linear descendant of that kind of integrity and these sort of Philistine barbarians, the Yuan, were in control. So um, even though there were, he had peers who did this classical painting, as you can see, everybody, I hope, this is a very weird and extraordinary and original way of doing uh, a mountain soap, this extraordinary kind of scaly, almost dragon-like um, representation of rocks, much more stylized than naturalistically. And above all, all the other Yuan painters adopted an extremely minimalist spare style. What you're looking at is anything but minimalist, isn't it? And if you ever get a chance to see, um, see the art, oh, a bit more focus. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, if you actually ever see this scroll, or even if you sort of see it online, you'll see that the brushwork is extraordinarily free and stabbing and loose. And this is not an accident. Towards the left, as you're looking at it, is a tiny pavilion in which a lone philosopher, uh, a sort of Taoist philosopher scholar is sitting. On a retreat, this is called um, dwelling in the Qingbian Mountains, which is a favorite place to kind of commune with the eternal verities if you're a Taoist, um, it, it was a sort of standard feature of this kind of picture, but it was unusual for you to be absolutely alone. This particular pavilion in this particular mountain range belonged to Wang Meng's family, to, to his extended family. And a war was raging, which was about to depose the Yuan. So I hope you're still with me, your Chinese history, and replace it with the Ming dynasty. So in fact, this is uh, he, the assumption here is that people know an enormous and brutal civil war is happening. And the sole philosophers, like the kind of, you know, the last of the Song dynasty painters is sitting there in a kind of... Um, tragic isolation really so the thing is fraught it's fraught in style it's jabbing it it reflects not the eternal verities of classical landscape painting but in some ways the closest that classical painting would ever get to a sense of expressionism the landscape kind of molded in a way in which you know a long time later vincent van gogh would do um with those extraordinary paintings in in uh, in the south of france so let's go to the next picture if we could a uh, huge jump um, of 200 years this is again another story a bit really about how an artist comes sideways into a sense of political obligation and what you might do about it a lot of you will recognize this it's in the in the royal collection it's it's peter breichel or i'll call him the way he's always called in england Bruegel. Um, almost rhymes with bagel one of my favorite things and so this is peter Bruegel the elder um, and this is the Massacre of the Innocents. And um, it was painted between, and we don't quite know exactly the precise moment he painted it, but between 1565 and 1567. And this is a moment when a war is about to break out, a war of religion, of course, which ends up creating the Dutch Republic between Spain, which was the 
the the as it were the kind of dynastic proprietor of the Netherlands at that point and the Dutch Protestant rebels to the north. Now, all that we know about Peter Bruegel the Elder is in um, the kind of Dutch Vasari, a man called Karel van Manders' book of the lives of of northern European painters, particularly Netherlandish painters, which was published in 1604, which is almost half a century after Peter Bruegel died. So we have to take his word for it. But you have a strong sense, actually, you'll know that Bruegel specialized in, as Van Mander tells us, peasant scenes, peasant weddings, there's beautiful paintings done from Ankle Nicholas Jongelink um, of the months, of the seasons of the year, the Turin Vienna. And if you had to say, you know, was Bruegel taking sides in this, this is a very unusually emphatic sort of subdued polemic. The Massacre of the Innocents, which of course a very, very commonplace theme in religious art, this time is taking place in a Flemish village in the snow. And as a matter of fact, two winters, particularly the winter of 1565, was famously horrifically brutal and cold. Um, but now, if you if we if you move in, if you look at this, what is extremely interesting about this this painting is that it was over painted. Um, it's a story of the ma massacre of babies and small children, um, exactly the like on the orders of King Herod from the Gospel according to St Matthew. Um, and if we move in, I'm just looking absolutely to see is that oh there, there we have a detail okay. Um, and there you can see actually the one on the left. The um, um, the one on the left is the one you've just, um, I think it's the one you've just looked at really. And it's the one in the Royal Collection. And what you can see there very clearly is that, can you see the figure in with the fancy trousers in the middle? He is a German mercenary, a so-called lansquenet in, uh, in the army. And what he's sticking his pike into is a pig. Um, and if you were to go further back, you'd see actually, oh, you can see just behind the pig. Guess what? It's Christmas time. There are turkeys, new world turkeys. It is itself absolutely extraordinary that new, new, these new world animals actually appear. What happened was that Bruegel, um, who, as I say, is no born rebel. He actually does work for the man who was responsible for introducing the Inquisition into the Netherlands, a man called Cardinal Granvelle. But Bruegel was intelligent. He'd spent time in Italy. Um, he'd spent time with the great geographer, philosopher, Ortelius, with Giulio Clovio. So he was not by any means a kind of a, a, a crude artisanal painter. This painting passed into the hands of the Emperor Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor based in Prague. And he was so disturbed by the fact, can we go back to the big painting, Graham? Is it possible to do that? Okay, yeah. Can you see the troops in the middle? That's actually fine. Um, he was so really disturbed actually that um, it looked like him, the imperial troops who were about to invade the Netherlands and impose the Inquisition and impose all sorts of sorrow and horror on, um, on the villagers, that he had it overpainted with animals and birds. What we know of, and if we can go back to the detail, if we can go back to the split screen detail, thank you very much. Um, there you can see dead baby on the woman's lap. Um, you can see that their lances actually poking into cribs and into the bodies of small children, the full horror, blood on the snow. And I don't know if we've got, have we got the full painting of the one on the right? This, as you can see from the caption, was done by, pretty, we're, we're pretty certain by this, um, by one of Peter Bruegel the Elder's two sons, almost certainly Peter Bruegel the Younger. And um, it was, and it's not overpainted, everybody. Um, it's reliably dated to shortly after. So later in the 1560s, probably 1567. So oddly enough, the one done by his son, I hope you're all still with me, the one done by his son gives us a better idea because it's not overpainted and it has the full horror of what Peter Bruegel himself had in mind. Bruegel himself dies two years later in 1569. So we don't know if he would go on to be the real kind of rebel 
uh, rebel painter. But like a lot of painters, you know, he was perfectly capable actually of satisfying two different kind of patrons at the same time. Uh, but this is in its way, as Samira mentioned, it's a kind of revolutionary, revolutionary painting. And it's an absolutely unsparing view of the horrors of war that could take place, taking place in a contemporary scene and in contemporary dress. So let's move on to another painting which tries to do the same thing. This is actually called The Consequences of War. It's by Peter Paul Rubens, it's in the Pity Palace. It was done by Rubens who loved pleasing absolutely everybody. And Peter Paul Rubens is one of the very few sweetie pies in the history of great art geniuses, I have to say, like Bruegel, but much more much more self-consciously so. He's a humanist. His brother is works with the great um, philosopher Justus Lipsius. Um, Rubens, his brother, and Lipsius, who edited a, a great edition um, of Seneca, thought of themselves utterly in the tradition, both of classical ancient humanism, but also above all in the tradition, of course, as you'll all be one step ahead of me, of Erasmus. And it's Erasmus's polemics against the horrors of war, which a good humanist really inherits. He's, in Britain, we know him as Sir Peter Paul Rubens. Um, <laughs> I like to think there's a bit of a kind of horsey, knightly companionship there. Rubens wouldn't feel the same way about me, I think. And now, horrifyingly, I'm just looking at myself. So can we have Rubens back? Are we going to get Rubens back? There we are. Thank you very much. And... Um, Rubens, as you can see, was in fact a peacemaker. He was actually responsible. I, I, I should say, everyone, that what began in Peter Brechel's time, the beginning of that religious war, the war of religion, of course, goes on for something like at least 150 years. And this was painted in around 1630. 839, I think I've got that right. I'm, I, like all historians, I'm terrible with dates. And, um, but it's around 1638-39. And in 1630-31, Rubens had negotiated a peace treaty between England and Spain. Um, and uh, part of his job when he was made a knight was to represent the uh, apotheosis, the glorification of Charles I's father, James I, which you can all see um, I guess, when museums emerge from lockdown on the ceiling of Inigo Jones's banqueting house in, in Whitehall. So, so he does this for um, Ferdinand II, the, the Medici Duke of Florence, which is why it's in the Pitti Palace. And you can see, instead of having that very aggressive, um, contemporary, raw, crude genre painting feeling that soldiers are stabbing babies it's all made very very allegorical but by god it's made for me anyway um it has an extraordinary kind of dynamic emotional as well as compositional charge to it that it the, the, if we can is it possible graham to remove my ugly mug from the top i'm looking at it because then you have the thank you very much yeah that's even better um the figure on the left with her arms in the air everybody class wake up if you've fallen asleep i want you to remember the figure of the woman in black there with her arms in held up to the sky and i'm not going to tell you why you're supposed to be remembering it i'll just i just hope you do she is thought to be europa and this is a scene taken from Ovid's Fasti. Um, and Ovid tells us that in times of terrible war, the temple of Janus has its door open. You almost might think of it the other way around. It, in times of peace, the door can be closed. So the door is open. This distraught figure of Europe torn to pieces rushes out. In the middle is Venus, of course, the goddess of love with a terrible, horrible boyfriend not a Me Too person, Mars. And Mars is trampling on the arts. Can you see at the bottom of the, he's trampling on writing. Um, down below is the figure of Harmony with that nice off the shoulder kit. And the lute is broken under her arm. The kind of demonic figure who is the bad person in all this is the Fury, female Fury with a, having an incredibly bad hair day, even worse than me, um, called Electo. And Electo is kind of pulling the whole of Europe further and further into catastrophe. Um, and there are figures also um, 
very often as a part of this ensemble, there's a figure of a mother and a child also in the process of destruction. So Rubens also is someone who wants to please everybody. He's pleasing the Medici. He's making a picture of what happens to harmony and art and music and all the things that make life worth living, don't they, everybody, right now, um, when that destruction takes place. So if we can move on. Um, three years earlier, uh, here's another somebody who is a very much an official painter, um, Diego Velasquez, who's court painter, of course, to King Philip IV. We're still in the middle of this pan-European horrible war of religion. This was um, Velasquez, along with his patron, the Count Duke of Olivares, was responsible for decorating a new pavilion, um, which, is, which was called the Hall of Realms at the Buen Retiro Palace. And the Hall of Realms was designed to make visiting diplomats feel impressed and possibly depressed by the invincible magnificence of the Spanish Empire at precisely the point, really, where Spain was actually not winning all the battles. So its walls were lined with images of surrenders. But Velasquez, who's again, uh, you know, you'll know from the, his greatest masterpiece, Las Meninas, has a kind of quizzical, ironic, sardonic view on power and pomp. Las Meninas, King Philip, and his queen reduced to a weedy weedy mirror image at the back. We, that, that's for another British Academy day talk to you if you can stand it um, and can pass all the homework tests. Um, but here Velasquez, when his own contribution to the Hall of Realms is the surrender of Breda, the town actually closest to which Peter Bruegel actually had, um, had grown up. And I don't want to go back to the Bruegel because um, uh, that's too much of a technological test for me, although not for Graham, I'm sure. But you may have seen, if you saw the big painting, this row, almost like a musical notation of pikes or lances at the back. I'm sure uh, it seems to me very likely that Velasquez might have known that and actually translates it into this extraordinary kind of curtain screen between the actual battle going on, you can see in the background, and what's going on in the foreground. So why is this a kind of a slightly dissenting oppositional painting. Well, for a start, the two commanders are made absolutely equal. Maybe not absolutely equal, but more or less equal. We know who they are. Um, the, my dear fellow, I'm so sorry you had to lose, is the Marquis de Spinola with the victor's sash. Um, in front, uh, neck, uh, the man giving up the keys is a man called Justinus of Nassau, who was actually in reality, I think, 80 or something. He was much, much older than, than Velasquez decided to represent him as. But Velasquez wants it to be an exchange of gentlemen. The notion is that as long as there is a kind of chivalric ethos in the Spanish Empire, you know, the Spanish Empire will survive. But there are these extraordinary kind of discordant grace notes, if I can call them that. Can you see the figure on the extreme right? That is almost certainly a self-portrait, um, a slightly dyspeptic look that Velasquez generally has and certainly has in Las Meninas. But of course, the, the most, there's a bunch of victorious toffs, actually, all of, some of whom are possible to identify looking out at us. But the figures who are really most beautifully painted are the losers, don't you think? And particularly we have someone, this beautiful figure of an ensign or a herald or something, looking down his white coat, either stained with blood or embroidered with roses or both. And above all, this extraordinary kind of quizzical, sad figure on the left as you look at it, looking straight at us. Um, really, uh, you, you know, does he look like someone who doesn't think life is worth living any longer because he's been defeated? I think probably not. He looks like someone who is saying, you know, isn't this all a ridiculous masquerade, all this chivalry um, and all this uh, sort of absurd delusion, engaño, the Spanish called it at the time. Um, and um, so this is a very, it's a profoundly unorthodox picture. The, the fact was that Spinola did indeed allow Justinus van Nassau to march out of Breda with all the flags flying. And you can just see the Dutch flag in the background between the horse and Spinola and the pennants on the end of the pikes. So they actually are allowed, you know, through the magnanimity. This is a painting all about compassionate magnanimity. And this, of course, is so extraordinarily 
not like what was really going on, which was, but it was the image that needed to be presented at the Hall of Realms. I'm just going to hold up the other image, which I stupidly did not think of, of getting for you. And I'm going to hold it up to the camera and hope, this is my own copy of an extraordinary book called by Jacques Callot, who's the great engraver to the court of Lorraine in the around this time, between the 1620s and the 1640s. And some of you will recognize these images. Can you see it, everybody? Um, this is what's going on. Um, I'm waving it in front of the, okay. Is that, is that, is that being said? I hope you can see it there. And it's someone being shot by a firing squad, which will become relevant in a minute. And I'm just going to show you one other print. These are the kind of great and um, little sorrows. There's the hanging tree. Okay. This is more like it. It's just an, again, an extraordinary Just image produced by Jacques Hollow. I can. Hold there it back we a little. go. How's that? Oh, yeah, no, it's okay. A and then bring it down and bring it down. Okay. Yeah, there that? you go. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. 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 And there it is. So thanks, Amira. There we are. That's more like what was going on. And it is absolutely extraordinary that Kahlo found a market for these little prints, which he certainly did. This is actually a Dutch edition, hand tinted in the um, in the front, so that you know it was possible again, particularly in Northern Europe, to have a much more brutal, realistic image actually of what were, what what the true cost of war was, which was far more grave in a way than than Rubens's allegorical version or Velasquez's kind of dance of two gentlemen commanders. So if we can and go so on to, to the be next, aware that we're, we're moving on. over halfway through now in terms of total time. We so. are. We yeah. are. Okay. I'm dancing as fast as I can. Um, but so uh, good. But thank you very much, Samira. Move me on. So we can move on to Goya. I think it's Goya. Is it not? Can we have the next slide? Oh, yeah. Um, I tell you what, Graham, why don't we move on? Can you move on to the next one? Okay. So I'm showing you this because I hope that, that one of the little callow prints was visible to you, which showed more or less something very similar to this extraordinary line of murdering firing squad that you can see in Goya's. This is, of course, a lot of you will have seen this in the Prado Museum, the 3rd of May, 1808. So again, it's to be said, and this again marks an astonishing moment in art's capacity to represent the horrors of war or not. And uh, because Goya also does not begin life, again, like everybody we've been talking about, as a, a natural born dissident or an artist rebel. He's a court painter. Um, he paints portraits of the kings of Spain, starting with Charles III, who was genuinely interesting, enlightened monarch, and then his son, Charles IV, who's none of the above. Um, and Goya hangs out with those who represent the tolerant enlightenment side of Spanish intellectual and cultural life, Marquis de Jovellanos, who want to abolish the Inquisition, for example. Um, so you can it, it's not completely forcing matters to think of Goya as liberal going into the war, going into the great occupation. This painting of the 3rd of May takes place on the, the, the night after the great uprising in Madrid against Napoleon's French army, mostly Mamluk soldiers, um, in 1808. Napoleon had deposed the reactionary King Ferdinand VII. So in some sense, actually, what is, I think, extraordinary about this picture is that it inhabits, in crisis, two worlds at once. On the one hand, this is an image of Christian martyrdom, the yellow and white are the colors of the Catholic papacy, of course. Um, the, the figure who's being shot is uh, in the image of the crucified Christ. And if you weren't sure about that, probably can't see it on the slide. Um, the, his uh, left palm, uh, in other words, the right hand arm as we're looking at it now, is, has the stigmata of Jesus, of the savior on it. Um, but it's also a painting in which art itself has come to a terrible cul-de-sac. Um, light, if you think about it, which is the source of everything, um, everything really transfiguring in art, is really this terrible 
lantern which gives just enough light in the middle of darkness for this dirty business of the firing squad to take place. And the only person who has their eyes open, who is looking, I think, is the man who is about to be shot with an expression of both terror and utter defiance on his face, I think. Um, of course, the, the awful the awful disfigurement of the figure who's already been shot, his face reduced to a kind of bloody porridge at the bottom, is itself an extraordinary revolution in, in what artists felt they could legitimately do. Everybody else is really, uh, you can see the monks and the priests are covering their faces. And those who are carrying out the, uh, the execution are simply looking through down the sights of their rifle. So this is what art has come to, Goya says. As I say, he's sort of backed into this position, both formally as an artist, everything, the question on his mind, which will, of course, send him over the edge into madness, really, is what is it we can see? What can we see? Can we see horror? Is it sort of horrifying, abhorrent, to try and make art out of what we can see? You go to the next slide, the famous disasters of war, there again, an image of utter horror of the, of the cutting up of bodies um, in, by an art. This was so terrifying that Goya never imagined it would be published in his lifetime. Indeed, it wasn't. It was hidden away and couldn't actually be published until 1853, long after he was dead. Goya again tried to square matters with the reactionary Spanish monarchy, but it didn't work and he was exiled and he died in Bordeaux. But again, the whole notion that kind of everything about art, beauty, grace, the body, just simply there are moments when it all collapses in, uh, in a butcher's block, in a kind of butcher's display of hacked up meat. Let's go on to the next one. A very famous image indeed. And here again, you know, Pablo Picasso, this is Ganica, and the photo which, um, which very kindly Marissa Smith of the British Academy got um, and I didn't ask her to get this particular one, but it's a matter of, it's rather a bit of genius that she did. This is Picasso, again, rather like Goya, in two worlds at one, an ancient world and a modern world. The secret that Picasso kept quite close to his chest, I think, until he became quite an old man and he started to have kind of arm wrestling with um, with Delacroix and in, with El Greco and so on and do riffs on old master painting, is that he was an extraordinary kind of professorial art historical swat that he had in his head an entire encyclopedia of different kinds of art. So everybody, look at the right of Guernica, which as you know, is painted in the early part of 1937, deliberately for the Spanish pavilion in the Paris exposition, um, which opened in July, 1937. That figure is a direct quotation, isn't it, from the horrors of war. And the figure again, which become a, a, a trope really and representation of the horrors of war of the mother with the dead baby. So that takes us back to Peter Bruegel. It takes us back to one of the, uh, another detail from Rubens and a figure of the fallen warrior with his head down. Can you see, you probably can see the stigmata appearing very carefully painted in black and white um, on, on the extended arm. So that again is as if actually it's a, conflation, is it not, of the figure who'd been shot to pieces in the Goya. And it's also a quote from a, a medieval apocalypse um, uh, Bible that, uh, that Picasso knew very well, um, that was in Spain, the so-called, um, uh, oh, I've actually forgotten, Albana, I think it's called, but a medieval apocalypse, medieval illumination. So Picasso carried this in, while being the uber modernist and someone who for much of his life was not interested in politics at all until it actually came to, um, to the Spanish Civil War. His mom is trapped in Barcelona. He's looked on, he's recruited by uh, Republicans who are in Paris, he's living in Paris, not just to stand up for the Republican cause, but to be the honorary curator of the Prado. And Picasso took absolutely no time at all whatsoever to say yes, of course. And it was Picasso who helped choose the paintings which were convoyed out of the Prado by Laurie to the still Republican held city, port city of Valencia on the coast for a while until the Falange fascists took that as well. So he had a kind of almost impossible task. He wanted to do in Guernica something not unlike 
the Rubens allegory, something with that epic expansiveness. I was going to tell you about the photo as well. So tiny digression. What? Digress, Sharma? Surely not. <laughs> um, <laughs> and this is actually taken from the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, where it appeared in 1956 after the war. And the director, whose name, I, I'm so sorry, I've forgotten, had the absolute brilliant idea of reconstructing the, uh, the Spanish pavilion at the exposition of Paris in 1937, where it was this beautiful modernist building designed by um, José Luis Sert, who had uh, one of the people who came to Picasso to ask him to do what turned into Guernica had designed it. So it's a kind of classical international style modernist building. And they rebuild it in, in the middle of um, another modernist building, the Stedelijk, and then put Guernica in that. I, as far as I know, no one else took as much care to try and convey the feeling of this painting under siege, the kind of last weapon that the Republicans had in 1937 in what was going to be um, a, a losing cause. Um, and I, the only other detail that, you know, we could spend at least another hour on this, but if you I look at the light about at the 10 top, minutes. That, um, Yes, and um, uh, thank you very much. And um, the light bulb, the naked light bulb, of course, is in to me anyway. It's this is a night scene. It's very much like that light box of death in the Goya Third of May. And Picasso chose to make this black and white because it sometimes noticed that the first news he really got, the first images he got of the bombing of the Basque town of Guernica by the Luftwaffe were flying for Franco, um, was in Paris Soir, the evening paper that he bought in Paris, and where he saw uh, fires burning in, in the Basque city. So he turns it into something that's very much like movie tone news, isn't it? You know, has that kind of extraordinary black and white flicker and this extraordinary kind of stylized scratching on the body um, on the body of the horse, the impaled body of the horse, is a bit like newsprint, I think. So I'm just sort of saying that Picasso, when he finally, finally has a kind of moment of political vocation, which is real and deep and impassioned, takes on the entire history of image making about war uh, with him. It's interesting. Let's have the next image. Let's have the next picture. It's very interesting that after the war, this is not, of course, Picasso, this is a great German painter, Anton Kiefer, but when, uh, after the war, listening much too much to André Breton, in my view, Picasso actually briefly joins the Communist Party and does a series of actually egregious, obsequious homages to Stalin, including the worst portrait of Stalin ever, to the point it might even have been satirical, wishing Stalin happy birthday. But he does... He, he revisits Goya's 3rd of May in a painting called The Massacre of Korea, which if I'd have thought a bit more, I would, have, I would have had put up. But it is exactly Goya's firing line, except the men have turned into robots. And it's just, it's just absolutely soggy with bad faith, that painting, really. You feel that Picasso is doing out a sense of obligation to the kind of fourth international in Paris rather than with, in Guernica where he's allowed actually to let all of his art memories play. So this sense of actually coming to a vocation by looking back at the past is deeply apparent. And this is a picture from Anselm Kiefer in 1976 called Varus. Varus um, is in fact the Roman general who is defeated by Hoyman the German, by, um, by Arminius who's the leader of the German tribes in the Teutoburgwald in 9 AD. Um, and this had become a kind of fixation of German nationalists. It was an image that was dear to German romantics. Um, and it had been, of course, horribly corrupted and abused by the Nazis in their images. So Kiefer's idea was not to run away, as a lot of German painters and German young artists were doing at the time, not to run away from those art memories, but somehow revisit them, but to dirty it up with blood and grime and soot um, and, you know, the great depths of the primeval German forest then became a place actually of these claw-like, terrible, um, terrible claw-like trees which into which you walked at your own peril. So again, a, a complicated, Kiefer's whole thing was to try and actually unlock the, the obligation to forget 
in German art and in German memory. He's very eloquent indeed about how, you know, they barely had any education about the Third Reich at all. Uh, it was all kind of Frederick the Great and Franco-Prussian War and so on when he was at school. So we'll go on to the next one. You've got about um, five minutes. Yes, um, thank you very much for telling me. Um, here is a contemporary, a little older, Gerhard Richter. And here is, um, this is again a very moving little story, which I'll do in a lot less than five minutes. Richter, again, known as an abstract artist, um, someone experimenting with slick finish experiments in abstract color and so on. And one exception to that after the war was a series, which I'm not showing you, um, of the um, Bader Meinhof gang, where he, Richter was extremely interested in the opposite way from Kiefer, not in the kind of antiquity of art, but really on the way in which terrible moments are perceived through contemporary media. So he created a series of paintings, photographic paintings, based on photographs of the um, executed, the, the shot bodies of Ulrike Meinhof and Hans Joachim Bader. And he got into terrible trouble at the time he produced those images um, for seeming to sympathize, to represent them as martyrs, not unlike the figure in the Goya. So it, it understandably put Richter way off ever going near politics again. Now on 9-11, and I mean actually on the day, Gerhard Richter was flying into New York to have a show at the Marion Goodman Gallery. And when 9-11 happened, can you see the planes there are flying into the skyscrapers? When it happened, the plane was diverted, I think, to Chicago. Richter took an early flight back to Germany and uh, never went, uh, didn't, it took him a long time before he went back to America. But, and he, he absolutely wasn't up for doing a 9-11 painting. Um, but he was tormented by a sense of needing to. And when he discovered that what he would do is make a painting not about the moment of impact, but about the way we all saw it, millions saw it on television screens, you know, an image of, made up of bits and bytes, at the same time, direct observation and chilling media distance, he had his image. And Kiefer um, Richter actually abraded the canvas and scratched it and roughed it up in order to give it this extraordinary sense of co the contemporary flicker. So we'll go to the last image. I think I'm going to cross the line just in time. And it's of a, 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 an artist I admire enormously. Um, it, uh, Mona Hatoum, the Palestinian artist living in London. And Mona Hatoum has been extraordinary in actually evoking. I mean, here you see her cheese grater. And it's part of a series in which, as it were, domestic objects are magnified and made into instruments of torture. She does this with another, a, a lot of kitchen utensils. She's a great performance artist. She's a great video artist. And there's a sort of extraordinary sinister sense in which she takes something which is all part of our daily lives, something we take for granted, but if you're trapped inside a moment, and in the case of the Palestinians, long-term suffering and hardship, the entire universe of what to be a comfort zone, and I say this as a notoriously obsessed cook to you, everybody, <laughs> there's no more greater comfort zone than your kitchen, and you turn it into something which is deeply menacing. So she too, I think, she too wasn't, I think, an expressly political artist at the beginning. She was a great feminist artist at the beginning, including a video that was taken of a gastric canal, uh, which I actually recommend to you all. Um, so she goes from gastric canal uh, to kitchen appetite, and she's found extraordinarily brilliant original ways to say, in the middle of our ease, God knows everybody, we're not at our ease right now, um, don't forget crisis, conflict, and suffering. Hey, Samira, I've crossed the line. Hey, you know, you, ca you came in under the time. I was very impressed. Yeah, um, I didn't dare not to. <laughs> <laughs> you know what punishments I had lined up for you. I love the range as well um, that you've taken us across the centuries and different, um, well, obviously across the world as well. Um, we've got some really interesting questions. The first is, you, it's very timely. Um, can you explain how medieval art, and perhaps more generally art, has used portrayals of pandemics, such as the plague, to demonstrate yeah. God's judgment? 
Theta is almost always in uh, another great Bruegel painting, of course, The Triumph of Death. Um, there was one of my favorite books is a book called Painting in Siena After the Black Death by a very great art historian of the 1950s and 60s called Millard Mies, M-E-I-S-S. It's a magnificent piece of writing. And his point was to say after the Black Death, painting Siena was never the same. And, and the, the difficulty is he doesn't really clinch the point, in my view, at all, really. A lot of the things, for example, in the so-called transi tombs, which uh, take tomb effigies and turn them into sculptures of cadavers or half-eaten cadavers with worms eating at them, belong to a very kind of macabre, um, penitential, self-flagellating tradition, which actually predated the Black Death. Certainly those kinds of things must have come to seem much more apocalyptic. Um, but a lot of you will know The Temptation of St. Anthony by, by Hieronymus Bosch. Uh, one thing Carol Varmander says about Peter Brechel um, is that he's a second Jerome Bosch, which is the way a lot of people thought about it. And if you do want to see a picture which really strikes one as an omnium gathering, uh, gatherum of horrifying images of mass death. Um, the triumph of death again in the Prado, bought by the Spanish kings, is the, is the one to see. You know, are there pictures of people being, you know, loaded onto the wagons of the dead, like you know, Monty Python, the Holy Grail? I'm not dead yet. Um, no, there aren't. There aren't. There aren't. You know. Um, and it's just not really part of the brief or the visual vocabulary, actually, plague. Um, but there's plenty of visual vocabulary with the devil and the devil's attendants shoveling figures into hell, of course, some of whom are eaten by what might be thought to be disease, but it might just be a disease, sexual disease, for example, of their own making. So rotting flesh is certainly something that was part of the language of both sculpture and painting in the Middle Ages um, and continues to be into the early modern period. And obviously you're talking in the Middle Ages at a time when people's worldview is very much shaped by religious belief, which was absolutely integral yes. to their sense of yes. the identity, which obviously yes. changes when we get into the 20th century. Um, let's put you another well, question. It changes, from... it changes. Can I just say one thing? I promise not to make mm -hmm. it long. It, the, the crucial point is the Reformation, because actually, um, it, even with humanist reform in the 16th century, once the Reformation happens, you have a possibility of dissenting. So the first kind of oppositional images are Lutheran printed, not, not painted, because obviously Lutheranism and the Calvinism are hostile to altarpieces, but they're printed satires with all sorts of grotesque monsters representing the papacy and the Catholic Church. So as soon as the unity of Christendom cracks in two, you have the possibility of oppositional imagery. Uh, so this is a questioner from Adwer Owusu Barnier. Why, in your opinion, do you think artists across time have chosen to immortalize moments of crisis and great violence like this? And how far you know if any artists have ever kind of you know written or given um, reasons, you know, and have ever kind of you know left evidence of why they were inspired to capture particular scenes? Incredibly good question. Thank you. Mm. I, I actually think, you know, um, I, I suppose it's our times, my friend, but I mean, I, I gave you a very um, selective kind of, you know, um, bundle of images to look at, not because they're typical, but because they're atypical. If you were to take the whole of Goya's genre, for example, or Peter Bruegel's, you know, output, this would be an exceptional image. So I think actually the, the, the notion that art is meant to do something other than document public suffering is much more instinctive, you know, and Picasso's first battles really were almost entirely fought with um, traditional art, with traditional painting, his cubist battles. And then when he wanted to turn on modernism, he went back to a kind of neoclassical, that beautiful linear, I think it's beautiful, linear drawing he did in the 1920s. But he, he gets sucked and even goes to Spain, not to do in the early 1930s before the Civil War breaks out, not because he feels politically compelled, but because he's interested in bullfight paintings. He becomes obsessed with Goya's series called the Tauromachia and wants to do his own version of those. But he's sucked into the moment 
bit by bit with great reluctance, I think. And once he'd had this unfortunate, he would say that himself, unfortunate flirtation with the communist, with the Stalinist Communist Party. He never goes near politics ever again after the mid or late 50s. So it's sort of, you know, um, it, it, it takes a special kind of artist to be Banksy um, or, or, you know, uh, an artist really whose almost entire output is, or Mona Hatoum really, is committed to feeling as an, an absolute part of the vocation, a need to engage with history. And sometimes it goes awfully wrong. Sometimes it's banal or over the top. It's a difficult thing to do. Preaching as an artist is not what artists want to do generally. Here's another terrific and timely question from um, Shasaki. What is your view of the toppling of statues? When is it right or wrong? Is it yeah. okay to expect history to conform to modern morality or is it a form of censorship? Yeah, well, um, yes, very good and tiny question. Um, and the, the weasel way to reply to you is that I wrote a whole article on this in the Financial Times <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. So if I'm much too summary now, um, I, the, the main point, which I, it's not an original point at all, but it seems to me to be made important to make, is that statues are the opposite of history. Um, the criticism has come, dare I say it, from that famous historian, Boris Johnson, Prime Minister of the still relatively United Kingdom, um, and um, to say that we are raising history. We're not raising history. Nearly all of these statues, if we take, I'm talking to you from America now, and there's a similar debate about the removal of Confederate monuments, because after all, the Confederacy was you know, devoted to, to destroying the United States of America in the name of the preservation of slavery. All those monuments were put up during the Jim Crow period in the 20th century, when the South was trying to reassert the legitimacy of what they call the lost cause. Similarly, a lot, not all, but most of the monuments we're talking about um, were actually, the, the, the one Robert Milligan was actually created a slave trader that was actually removed in, in front of the Docklands Museum, was made relatively soon after, um, you know, after he actually died in the early 19th century. But if you think about it, history is a debate. Its entire badge of integrity since Thucydides was a pain in the neck for the Athenian authorities because Thucydides wrote a history of criticism attacking the hubris of the expedition to Syracuse. So the whole honor and integrity really of history is about open-ended debate, endless revision, having arguments about what was good, what was bad and so on. A statute freezes a heroic moment. And as I say in the article, kind of brooks no debate. So I also think most statues are awful anyway, you know. Um, do you think there is a case for potentially saying actually the time has come, this one needs to go? Or I think if it's, I think it, I, I would love to see um, that depedestalization, and you wouldn't be able to say that, as a moment for debate, which we're having. You know, it's work, doesn't it? I mean, there is a debate about the relationship of the slave trade to what to the British Empire and what became of it. So I've no, I've no problem about. You know, the Rhodes Foundation has done a great deal of good inadvertently is the result of a legacy from a truly vile person. You know, not just a racist, but, an, you know, an imperialist to the max, someone who actually was responsible, basically, for the outbreak of the Boer War, which costs, you know, untold lives and misery. So I have no problem about you know, yeah. taking those those statues. I should down. say, I've just recorded a program for Radio Four going out next Wednesday called "Race in Our oh, Public yeah. Spaces," which is exactly this topic. Mm. So, a little Good. plug there. I'll, listen, I'll <laughs> listen to it. To me, one thing. One thing that's lovely about being in in America, I can listen to radio, although I'm not allowed to look at iPlayer. So I will listen oh, in. Well, what? When's it going out? That. Wednesday. I'm not sure what time. Okay. But um, it's okay. got it's got the American as well as the European angles Fantastic. on it. Um, Fantastic. There is one more really good question I want to fit in before we finish, um, which is how did I think this is the Thirty Years' War we're talking about? How did the Thirty yeah. Years' War affect artistic output and forge the Enlightenment um, art? And it is Ooh. interesting because the Thirty Years' War is such a horrific moment in history. I yeah. keep thinking back to it, you know, and we haven't really mm. it's not studied as much in Britain as it is. I think on oh, the it continent. should be. No, it should be. Yeah. No, you have a you have a good point. Well, I think that little. I'm not sure I did it very well. I was a bit of a 
um, uh, you know, a bit of a klutz, a bit of more, more of a klutz, showing you my callow print. But in a way, the callow print of, you know, a murderous firing line and people hanging from trees is really, that's why I, I wonder if Goya saw it, you know, is really the kind of precedent for Goya. What happened in the Thirty Years' War is two mutually exterminating versions of Christianity fought each other to a standstill in horrifying ways, whether you look at Ireland or you look at Germany, um, in absolutely horrifying ways. So a kind of sheer horrible exhaustion set in. And in a way, the capstone to writing about the Thirty Years' War was not ostensibly written about the Thirty Years' War at all. It's, it's Voltaire's Condide, where you have kind of mad people for reasons they only dimly understand, the Bulgars and whatever it was, just slaughtering each other for a kind of grotesque body count. So in that sense, the question is an extremely good one, because I think the sort of sense that a sort of plague on all your houses, what after all was the point? of seeking to exterminate each other, that, you know, mutual annihilation is, is a really a cause to go to war for. That does seed the skepticism of the Enlightenment. It doesn't last, you know, it doesn't last. I mean, nationalism, when it gets going, as we will try and make the case in our series on the Romantics, mm -hmm. when nationalism gets going, it substitutes the flag and the national anthem for what had been a war to the death of mutually annihilating confessions. As we are drawing to a close, obviously the reason we're having to have this event like this is because of COVID-19. Yeah. And I, I wonder, do you think it will prove to be a turning point in art? Um, I don't know, Samira. I really don't know. It's, it's, I, I, you know what I do think it will be a turning point in, in the art world, which isn't the same. I mean, fairs, it's going to be very difficult to conduct fairs. Um, I have a son who's an artist. Everybody look him up, gabrielsharma.com. <laughs> and uh, Gabriel has never needed a dealer or a gallery or let alone fair. There is actually the only fair that Gabriel's actually shown at. He works in abstract wooden reliefs. There's been um, a, a fair in LA, which is run by the artists. Other than that, he does everything online. People are welcome to come and see his work in a studio. But my point is there's this huge kind of weighty middle, you know, fancy galleries, grotesquely inflated prices, um, all of that might actually have, I mean, if that actually turns into shrinkage, I think that's no bad thing. What artists themselves will make of it is a very interesting point. You look at the horrible coronavirus, this mass murderer, and you think, boy, that's a pretty little thing, isn't it? You know, pretty poison, really. I bet there is an artist out somewhere doing microscope art, you know, molecular biological art. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, sadly, we're kind of um, out of time. Um, Simon, thank you so much. I, I can't think of thank a you, nice Simon. way to sort of deal with the isolation than to be talking to someone like you and hearing your thoughts. And I think crucially at this moment, looking back through art, looking back through history, and drawing, not exactly comfort necessarily, but, but sort of drawing a kind of nourishment from what... Thank you. We have a sense of community. We're all, try, we're, all, you know, we're all trying to connect, aren't we, Samira? You know, you and I connecting across the Atlantic Ocean. And for art historians, um, connections happen across time. You feel a kind of bond with, with historical, with figures who are no longer with us, I think, actually. And art can do that in a profound way. If, if this wretched purgatory we're all going through gives us a deeper insight into the common things of humanity, some good might yet come of it. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you, um, Simon Sharma, for thank such an enlightening conversation. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank just to remind everyone, thank you for all your questions and um, appreciate you joining us from all over the world. Please refer to the British Academy's website and social media channels um, for details about future events. But thank you again and have a lovely weekend.